Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. In today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about behind the scenes of the modeling project, the untold stories of data curation. Before I move on to the topic, I would like to convey my thanks and appreciation to my team members. I joined the Simulations Plus family a few months ago and the team has been wonderfully supportive and helpful as I transition from PhD life to industrial workplace. Many special thanks to Pankaj, Michael and Bob for being available to answer all the questions that I have and I have had a lot of questions and for all the guidance. I'm very appreciative of their generosity in sharing knowledge, expertise and wisdom which makes my life a whole lot easier. And also Marv and David and the rest of the team for helpful, fruitful and passionate discussions to help guide me in the right directions. I feel very happy and grateful to be a part of this wonderful Chem Informatics team. The project that I was recently working on is MDCK project, but in Darby Kanai Kidney. It's a very popular and commonly used mammalian cell line extracted from dog kidneys to measure apparent permeability. Permeability is an important trait of drug candidates that has a big influence on absorption and distribution. So to give an overview of the pipeline, the first step is data mining, where I was collecting experimental data from databases and literature. And the second step is data curation which is actually the most heavy lifting part of this entire pipeline. This is where we make sure that the cell line information is correct. We verify ambiguous data and deal with a lot of messiness that is involved in the entire data set. The next step is descriptive generation. Once we have the curated data set and the descriptors, we start building models and validating them. Then we do external validation. At the end of the pipeline, we have a final model to make in silico predictions for the new compounds. The major focus of this presentation is going to be on the data curation part of the pipeline. So for MDCK data curation workflow, the very first step is data mining. So we were extracting data from Campbell, GoStar, and literature. And the original data set contained about 13,000 compounds. That's a whole lot of data. The second step that we were focusing on is cell line categorization. When we were looking at entries from databases, we find that cell line information is not properly annotated and in some cases not annotated at all. So that is a pretty important step because there are different MDCK cell lines. Some are infected with MDR, multi-drug resistant genes, some are low efflux cell lines. And they cannot be mixed together because a compound measured through different MDCK cell lines will have different permeability values. So we need to categorize them properly. It means that we need to go back to the literature and extract that information. In this workflow, we're only focusing on MDCK generic and MDCK1 cell line. The next step is to determine if the entries are experimental or predicted values. When we were looking through the data, they don't have annotations on whether they are in silico or experimental values. So we actually have to go back and confirm that as well, because we only want to use experimental values. The next step is data integrity. In some cases, when we check the experimental section, we cannot verify the cell line information and there is no clear information and some of the entries are pretty odd and they have really weird units. So in those cases, we discard those ambiguous entries to make sure that the data and integrity is intact. The next step is permeability direction. So we're only focusing on one direction where it is traveling from apical to basolateral. So we extracted the permeability directions as well and retained only A to B direction. If you look at each of these steps, they are pretty heavy and tedious because we have to locate the original resources and extract the necessary information. So we use a lot of automation, text mining combined with human intelligence to help accommodate this process. The next step is chemical data processing. This is a standard procedure in any chem informatics project. So we do structural cleaning, removing salts, standardization of functional groups. We also treat different tautomorphic forms and ensure that there are no structural duplicates in the data set. The next part that I want to focus on is mystic diagnosis and correction. This is a very important step. So I'm going to bring some excerpts from different articles. Here it is saying that the error rate for the compounds in databases, for example, Wombat, can be as high as 8%, which is a pretty significant number. And this is an article from our Simulation Plus company. Here it also says that the fraction that is not accurate in chemical databases is uncomfortably large, up to 10%. It is a pretty significant amount, so we put a lot of effort into chemical data curation. 
meaning that we try to detect possible mistakes in the data set like PAPP values, biological endpoints, cell lines, structures, and units. We also do a lot of manual inspection, and this is done with a combination of methods including data analysis, automated scripts, duplicate assessment, human intelligence, and manual assessment. So at the end of the entire pipeline, after doing a whole lot of chemical data curation, we ended up with about 891 entries, and this is the final curated data set for MDCQ cell line. This slide is to show the frequency and distribution of the types of mistakes that we found in the MDCQ project. So there are a lot of ambiguous cell line information that we couldn't verify, somewhat units. Just to show an example, this is actually from the literature. The unit of permeability is given as per second. The actual unit should be something like microcentimeter per second, nanocentimeter per second, or something like that. Um, there are also wrong cell line annotations, directions, endpoint values, and structures. In the cases where we can't really verify the information, we discard the entries from the dataset. If we are able to locate and verify that the information is incorrect, we retain them and correct them in the dataset. At the end of this data curation process, we corrected about 270 entries, which account for about 30% of the final dataset. It is a significantly large number. The other point of this slide is to emphasize that there are mistakes abandonedly present in the databases, and there should be a lot of effort that goes into chemical data curation part of the pipeline. Finding mistakes in the chemical datasets can be very challenging. It can be like finding Waldo. As you can see in this picture, it can be very difficult to track down Waldo. And in this example, I'm using Waldo as a metaphor for mistakes in the dataset. And the chemical datasets can be quite messy and chaotic. There are two major challenges as we try to find mistakes in the datasets. The first one is we don't know how many mistakes are out there, and we cannot be 100% confident about the dataset correctness especially if the dataset is large, but our goal is to find as many mistakes as we can using the tools and methods that we have. The second major challenge is there can be many different types of mistakes out there, so we have to be aware of the types of mistakes that can exist in the project that we're working on. For example, in the MDCK project, there can be mistakes in the form of biological endpoints, units, structures, um, cell line information, and the direction of permeability and these mistakes can vary depending on the type of the project. In the next slides, I'm going to be showing some example mistakes from MDCQ dataset and how we are detecting them. Here is a screenshot from the actual project. These structures have very large PAPP values. They are on the scale of a million or more centimeters per second, which doesn't make sense because it's way beyond the distribution of the entire dataset. So when we look at the literature, this is how it is being reported. This is not necessarily a, a million centimeter per second. This is more of a formatting issue. So we corrected that to micro centimeter per second just to show how differently the units are being reported. I'm going to show you some more examples. This is also how it is reported here. The formatting is slightly different and you can also see that here. This is the most common unit format that we saw in the literature. This type of mistake is actually coming from the database, but this comes because of the unit formatting inconsistency in the literature. And these can normally be detected by distribution analysis because they tend to fall outside the distribution range of the majority of the dataset. Here are some more examples with mistakes in the PAPP values. These are more subtle and harder to detect. For example, this structure is reported to have a PAPP value of 0.87 nanometer per second in the database. But when we actually look at the literature, the value is 0.87 micro centimeter per second. So the difference is subtle. Here are two more examples. This compound is reported by the database to have 0.000301 centimeter per second, but in literature it is 30 micro centimeter per second. So this is more of a decimal mistake. And here is another case with the same decimal issue. These mistakes related to decimal and unit conversion mistakes are very common and also a little bit harder to track, but we can still track them down using distribution analysis because we were manually checking compounds near the end of the distribution spectrum and uh, we were able to find those mistakes. The other method we could use is by duplicate structural assessment. So these compounds were reported by more than one database and 
Since we were looking at duplicate structures, we started noticing that they have different biological endpoints, which makes them suspicious cases. So we went back and confirmed that some were incorrect. This is a structural mistake. This one is coming from database one, and there is a methyl group here. This one is from database two, and there is a hydroxyl group here. They have the same PAPP values. When we go and check the literature, they are coming from the same source, and the correct structure is the one with the hydroxyl group. So this structure is correct. These cannot be detected by using duplicate structural assessment because obviously the structures are different, but we were able to find them because they came from the same literature source here and they share the same biological endpoint as well. It makes them suspicious entries. These cases can be detected by using duplicate endpoint assessment. This is another structural mistake that I want to talk about. This is coming from a database and it's reported by only one database. When we look it up in the original literature, it's actually the same. The structure in the database is exactly how the others are reporting it in the article, but it is not correct because when we look at the compound in different databases, there should be a sulfur here instead of an oxygen. Based on the consensus by multiple databases, we confirm that this is the correct structure and we retain that one. So in this case, the mistake is coming from the literature and we were able to verify it because we were using a structural verification script developed internally to check structures where the names are being reported. This is another structural mistake example which is hard to track down. Here is 15E compounds, so 3Cl which should be here. But in the database, the record shows the CL here which is not correct. So we were able to find that these types of mistakes can be found accidentally and in this case, we found it by cluster analysis. To show what I was doing, here we grouped them based on similar structures and we were making predictions using different sets of models and seeing how they perform. And we found that this particular class is not doing very well in terms of predictions. So we manually checked each entry and we were able to find that one of them was wrong. So cluster analysis was useful in that case. To conclude this presentation, there are several mistakes present in chemical and biological databases. They can come in so many forms as stated here. These mistakes can be fished out using a set of methodical and creative approaches based on the project's nature. Here are some of the methods that are being used to fish them out. The major takeaway from this presentation is that we should put a lot of effort into mistake detection and diagnosis part of the data curation process to make sure that what we have is a well-curated, high-quality data set that can be modeled. That is the end of the presentation, and thank you so much for your kind attention.